Hi everyone, welcome to episode 64 of the Startup Playbook podcast. My name is Rohit Bhargava and each week I interview successful founders, investors and subject matter experts on how they got started, the strategies they use to succeed and their advice to current and future entrepreneurs. With a lot of today's media attention on the startup industry being focused around raising large funding rounds and successful exits, the challenges, struggle and sheer resilience required to even get to that point can often be overlooked. Someone who epitomizes the real journey to success is my guest for today's episode, Kate Morris, the founder and CEO of Adore Beauty. Today, the company is a huge success. It has over 190 brands on board, 13,000 products available online, and an annual turnover of $28 million. But the company wasn't always a roaring success. Kate founded the company in 1999 as a 21-year-old with just $12,000 to cover all operating costs, and she struggled to get buy-in from the industry with only two little-known brands joining Adore Beauty at launch. It took Kate several years to get major brands on board, and it wasn't until 10 years into her business that she saw substantial growth in the company. In this interview, we talk about the importance of resilience, why you should focus on customer loyalty, the importance of building relationships, and how writing a letter to a future self changed Kate's outlook on the business. Without further ado, here is my interview with Kate Morris. Hi, Kate. Welcome to the Startup Playbook podcast, and thanks so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to be here today. My pleasure, Rohit. So you've just come off a flight and uh, from Sydney? Yes, that's right. After a busy day of shooting? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were shooting today for the um, Cosmo Women of the Year Awards, so... For the people in the room, I do not usually wear this much makeup. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So, Kate, for for those people that may not be as familiar with you or your background, do you want to share a little bit about your story and uh, what got you here today? Sure. Um, Well, that's that's going to take up the next 40 minutes. But, um, yeah, so Adore Beauty is Australia's first online beauty retailer. I started it out of my garage. Um, in late 1999, so we first went live in April of 2000. Um, very, very early days. So pre-smartphone, pre-Facebook, pre-broadband, literally on dial-up and crawling under my desk to have to, you know, unplug the modem and plug the phone in. So it was, um, it was very, very early days. So I started just with two teeny, teeny, tiny brands that um, basically don't exist anymore. Uh, but yeah, I've spent the last, well, yeah, 17 and a half-ish years building it up and it's um, it's actually getting really big now, which freaks me out sometimes. Um, <laughs> we've got a team of about 75 so we're based in based in Northcote and we've got, I think we've got about, I don't know, 1,500 square metres there and um, yeah, it's, it's pretty wild. Absolutely. I, I mean, you know, these days, um, I feel like it's almost never been easy to start a startup. Um, with the click of a few buttons, you know, you can you right. can launch you can launch a website. That's it. Yeah. Um, but I, I assume back in 1999, the the market was very different. It is. You pretty much had to chisel your websites out of stone. Um, it's. Uh, I'm I'm actually glad I haven't saved many of the pictures of our original website. It was literally the ugliest thing in the world. It was gross. The entire internet was gross. Um, so yes, the very original, uh, it was a Perl script website, it had no back end. Um, I had to teach myself how to code it to try and make updates to it because basically after I paid for the initial build I couldn't afford the web developments <laughs> anymore. And uh, yeah, and certainly from as far as the beauty industry perspective goes, um, beauty industry did not want a bar of, of online in the year 2000. It was, no, it was a nasty fad that was going to go away and nobody was ever going to buy cosmetics on the internet. I, I, I want to come back to, to the products because I, I think there's there's heaps of things that I want to dive in there. But sure. um, yeah, I, I was reading, uh, doing my research on this interview as well, was uh, you taught yourself how to code by borrowing books from the library or, or something. Yeah, well, that's it. Yeah. Yes. like From what the was... library, <laughs> actual book. Oh, I know. Yeah. Yeah, again, like, what, what was that sort of process like? Um, you know, I, I think you were sort of mentioning that you were 21 at the time, yeah. you know, very new to the space. How did you sort of go about, you know, overcoming so, some of those sort of initial challenges? Like, what was, yeah, what, what was kind of like pulling you through or, or kind of getting you to, to essentially teach yourself to code from scratch? Look, I guess the good thing about when you start a business when you're 21 is that you have no idea of all of the things that you don't know, uh, which probably is you know sometimes that's a good thing because you can charge in um, without 
being terrified of the huge mountain of things that you that you're going have to have to overcome. Um, Look, it was it was really more out of necessity. I only had a very limited amount of starting capital, which I borrowed from my boyfriend's dad. Um, I had twelve thousand dollars. I'd figured out that was the bare minimum that I would need to get the website off the ground. So that was enough for the website and some stock, and that's it. Um, not enough to pay me. Not enough to do any marketing. Didn't really think about any of that stuff. I just thought, right, this will this would get it started. And um, yeah, it was really just out of necessity. I thought, right, well, I. I hadn't really thought about the fact that when you build a website, you also need to change it every week. You, know, you need to put new stuff on the homepage and you need to add new brands sometimes and you need to be able to add new products. And I, just, I didn't have any money to pay somebody you know, $180 an hour to make any changes to it. So I thought, right, well, I'm just, you know, it's my website, I can download the code for it. So I just downloaded the code for it and went and borrowed some books and thought, well, I'm just gonna have to figure out how it all works. And the good thing about that, I guess, is that because it didn't have very much traffic, if any, if I broke it and it went down for an hour, I could, <laughs> nobody's nose has got out of joint and I didn't really lose any sales. So, um, you know, it was just one of those things that you, you end up doing out of necessity, really. Looking, looking back, how important was it for you to have gone through that process of learning how to code to understand your product? Look, the good thing about it, and don't get me wrong, I'm not a good coder. I'm not allowed anywhere near our science code anymore at all. Um, the good thing about it is that I knew how everything in my business worked every single thing. I knew how the website worked and so that I knew that if I asked someone to make a change for me um, and they gave me some ridiculous quote, you know, I knew when they were having a land, it's, I could at least say, well, I don't actually think it is that big because all you have to do is, you know, you do this, this and this. And ma maybe they were things I didn't know how to do, but I knew what had to be done. So it's kind of like knowing how a car works when you take your car into the mechanic, you know, <laughs> you know when you're being taken for a ride. And um, I guess that's been the benefit of having that knowledge as the business has grown is that I've done every job in our business at least once. And um, so I, know, you know, I do, as a general rule, know how stuff works. Um, and I, you know, I think that really is beneficial because then at least you can understand, okay, when I'm trying to th scope out new functionality for the site, I know what tweaks I can make that might make it not so big of a job or, um, you know, it, it just, yeah, it makes, it makes everything a little bit easier. Yeah, and as, as you mentioned as well, I think we spoke about this in the last episode with, with Glenn Rabby as well, about um, the importance of if you at least have a baseline understanding of what it takes, you know how to hire for those positions as well. So whether you're sort of contracting That's that it. out or... So you know what you need. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And look, I knew, I knew how to scope things up properly. Um, I knew how to specify exactly what problem I was trying to solve and how I wanted it solved and how I wanted it to work in the end. Um, and uh, yeah, you... That's the feedback I've had from all of the developers that I've worked with is, is that, you know, look, I might be demanding, but at least I can actually, <laughs> I can enunciate exactly what I want. Absolutely. So, so coming back, I mean, we, we touched on this a little bit earlier, but obviously very, very different market in 99. Sure. When you're, um, you know, launching the first e-commerce play of its time in, in Australia. Uh -huh. um, and ag again, we were kind of speaking about this before we turned on the microphone. Um, you know, it was very challenging to get the first few sort of suppliers or, or brands on board um, yep. with no real case studies to kind of point them to. Mm -mm. What, again, what, what was that sort of process like as a, as a 21 year old going to brands and, and trying to get them on board? Yeah, look, um, it's very character building. Um, I'll say that. So yes, uh, significant amounts of rejection over many years. So I just kind of got used to it. So I guess that's the upside is that now it doesn't bother me. Um, look, it was really tough. The beauty industry had always done things a particular way. Uh, prestige beauty products had always only been sold through department stores and that was something that the department stores are very comfortable with and that the beauty brands were very comfortable with and nobody was looking at the internet as an opportunity. They were looking at it as a challenge and a threat to the way that they'd always done business. And so it was very, very difficult, particularly for me as a 21 year old nobody from Tasmania, um, you know, to try and talk them into trusting me with these brands that had been around for 50 years. And, and it was very much a, you know, don't you know who we are kind of thing. And I do remember um, still very painfully uh, one brand 
rejecting us via fax. And it, it, <laughs> it came rolling out of the thermal fax machine and it was a letter basically saying that my idea was stupid and that nobody was ever going to buy this, you know, this kind of product online and that I'd basically offended them and wasted their time by even approaching them with my inferior presentation. And following that was 13 pages of thumbnails of covers of magazines that their products had been in. Who does that? <laughs> who does that to a 21-year-old who's having a go at things? So, um, yeah, look, some of it was pretty brutal. And I guess for me, in terms of what it taught me, um, as far as resilience goes, yeah, I, you know, after that, if you can live through that, you can pop back up from just about anything. Absolutely. I mean, there's there's one thing about um, again before we turn on the mic, we were talking about stubbornness and yeah. kind of kind of my story and how it took me three years to figure out that my my previous business wasn't going to work. Yeah. How do you how do you go through the rejections? Um, like, w what's the kind of balance between you know what everyone's saying no because they're right versus saying no but because they just don't get it or like I'm on the right path, I'm just not potentially selling it the right way. Yeah, that's it. And and I get a lot of people asking me that because, yeah, a lot of people say, oh, you know, my idea is not kind of, you know, resonating, I'm really struggling with it. How do you know when you should just quit? And I guess the thing that kept me going is that my customers got it. So when people would order from me, they would, or they would write in these fantastic emails or phone me and say, oh, this is brilliant. I'm never going to order cosmetics any other way again. Now, if you could just get brands X, Y, and Z, then I'll never have to go into David Jones. Um, and so when you're getting that reinforcement from your customers, yes, I didn't have very many because I didn't have any money for marketing, so it was really hard. But, um, but I knew that my customers didn't think it was stupid. So that for me was enough to say, right, well, I'm... I think the brands are wrong. In fact, I'm confident that they are because that's what customers keep telling me. So I'm going to keep at it. Um, but look, it is tough. It's a really tough call, and I don't, I don't know if there's a good rule that is useful for everybody to apply to their own situation. Um, I mean, if nobody gets it, then yeah, maybe it's it's not such a good idea. Um, but for us, I think it was more that just the timing wasn't right. And timing's one of the really tough things and, and pretty much all we had to do was wait longer and keep at it. But yeah, as far as stubborn goes, I'm the queen of stubborn. So I waited, to, uh, you know, probably 10 or 11 years really before things kind of started to, to take off. Um, whether that's a good idea, I don't know. We are where we are. <laughs> Well, I, I mean, it's it's interesting because like your your belief in what you were doing was still grounded in in some sort of external validation of you know customers telling you that that's what they wanted. It was sure. just a matter of you know potentially your your industry was you know just very traditional, yeah, um, and it just took them a little bit of time. Like again, you, you were mentioning that it took fourteen years for fourteen years for Estee Lauder. Yeah, that was um, that was one of the toughest. I mean, look, we still have brands that you know. There's a couple. Only a, only a couple now. In fact, probably only one that still doesn't return my calls. Just doesn't even just doesn't even want to talk about it. I think that's okay. You know, it's not right for you. That's all right. My customers are happy and they've got other stuff to buy. So you know, it's your loss. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I guess one one of the other things that kind of really sort of stuck out to me was, um, you know, a most people give up. Um, Fourteen years is a really really long time to it is wait. It's a long time, yeah. Um, but. Uh, you know, again, we, we, we had a bit of a chat before, before the, uh, we turned on the mic and, and you were mentioning that, you know, a lot of the times you were still, you spent that time building those relationships. And that's something that I think a lot of founders um, overlook yep. a lot is, is the importance um, of really fostering those relationships, especially when you're trying to get into businesses and, and large businesses. Oh, yes. Um, what was, you know, what were some of the, the strategies that you used to, to build relationships? Again, I, I think you mentioned that it wasn't anything that you were clinically trying to do, but you know, we're in the background, you, sure. you know, you knew that they would help. Yeah. Look, I cannot overstate the importance of networking and of building relationships. And it's something now that I spend actually quite a lot of my time doing, um, to the frustration sometimes of my business partner. He's like, look, I need you here to do some actual work. I said, I am working, you know, this is my work. This is what I do. Um, yeah, look, it's, 
I think I, I think I'd sort of realised somewhere, probably not not on any conscious level, but um, you know, on some level, okay, these brands, it's really trust was the issue, um, and their brand was the most precious thing in the absolute world, and I had to show them that nothing terrible would happen if they trusted me with their brand and that I was trustworthy. Um, and so there were a number of things that I did to build up um, a perception of Adore Beauty as being the trusted online retailer as far as beauty went. Um, and so, for instance, trying to make sure that I got involved in sort of the insider-only industry events. So there's a, a half-yearly lunch that happens in Sydney where all of the brands get together and they review the results for the entire industry and I managed to wangle my way into that so that they, you know, knew my face and, you know, just knew just to, knew, just to know who I was. Um, I offered to write a quarterly digital trends column for the industry retail um, retail magazine so that which I knew that all of the brands read every month so there we were being positioned as you know the online retail authority I've been doing that for years um, and even just constantly going back to even the people that said no even the people that were rude to kind of not take it personally and to just keep going back and say hey look you know yeah, it's, it's been a few months since we chatted. Just thought you'd be interested to know a couple of stats, you know, maybe about how the business was doing, um, maybe a couple of stats about what was happening in the industry, things that were happening in different markets, things that their competitors were doing with us that were getting really good results. Um, you know, and just, just kind of staying in touch. Sometimes, it, you know, sometimes I get no response for like a year, you know, just <laughs> these, these constant little emails, hey, you know, let me know if you want to chat. And then eventually, uh, you know, and it would always seemingly come out of nowhere that um, a brand would finally go, yeah, actually, it'd be good to have a chat, if, you know, if you could come in and, um, you know, we'll have a coffee and, and just have a bit of a chat about things. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's ev my philosophy now is that everybody says yes eventually. Um, and it's a matter of waiting for the timing to be right for them to and building up that trust so that when the timing is right or when all of a sudden they have their global CEO turn around to them after blocking e-commerce for the last 15 years and then say, right, we want 20% of your revenue to be e-commerce, that you're the one standing there and you're the one that they know and they've known you for years and that they, they wouldn't even consider talking to anybody else because you're the only one that they would trust. And that's, that's really how it's worked for me. I, I think the two things that really kind of stuck out to me from that was, you know, A, the need for consistency. So it's not, you know, a one-off meeting and then you touch base again with them when you kind of want to sell or, no. or when they're ready. No. And, and the second part of that is like really, um, as you mentioned, really kind of understanding who it is that you're trying to build that relationship with and what is it that, like, what are the barriers that you need to overcome or what That's do they it. need to do to build that, that trust with you? Yeah. Um, yeah. Was, it, was there anything that, like, as a 21-year-old, again, so you mentioned that, you know, you got sure. into, uh, I'm assuming it took you a little bit of time to get into these sort of um, programs oh, and yeah. writing the columns and stuff, but um, for anyone that's, that's, you know, new to an industry or, or at the early stages and wants to start building up those relationships or getting into those sort of things. Do you have yeah. any recommendations on how people should approach that or, or the way that they should go about it? Look, try and think of what you can offer them that's of value. And, and you know, ask them, look, just say, hey, look, I'm, you know, I'm connected in with these industries or I know these kinds of people, you know, what, what do you need? Like, ask more questions. Um, if you get a straight out no, then goodness, don't just take that, you know, try, get, find, find out more find out what the barriers are for them, find out what their needs are, find out how you can help. Um, and just approach it, for, you know, purely from, you know, don't, don't be asking for anything, just put yourself out there as, as a resource and someone they can trust. And, um, you know, you've got, to, you've got to take what you have. I mean, presumably if you're starting a startup, you at least think you know something about something. So, hey, can you, is there some interesting information? Maybe you come across an article that you think, that they that would be interesting for them to read because it's related to what you talked about. You know, just stay in touch. Absolutely. Um, so, uh, I mean, again, you, you kind of touched on this at the start uh, that Adore Beauty now is growing very, very quickly. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't always this way. No. And uh, you, I, I think you, you gave a talk at Above All Human. Unfortunately, I missed it because I was out at the back yeah. um, helping sort of set up a few things. But... Um, I think it was about 10 years or so before you kind of really saw the beginnings of that sort of hockey stick. Yeah, growth. yeah. Um, a, what kind of instigated that that quick growth for you at, at that particular time? And also, how did you, like, how do you overcome 10 years of... Of, of slugging of, it out. Yeah. Um, 
look, I guess you got to be doing something that you care about, right? You know, if, if you're doing something for the money, then just for goodness sake, don't get into this business. You know, it's, it's too hard. This is, there are easier ways. You know, go and be a lawyer or something. There are easier ways, um, you know, if you want to if you want to make money um, than starting a startup, to be honest. Um, so you really have to find a problem that you care about solving or, you know, customers that you that you care about solving that problem for them. And, and that's, it, you know, that's the only thing that's going to keep you going. Um, yeah, it's certainly not the money. I mean, I lived off nothing but like meagering packet noodles for at least the first couple of years. So it was pretty brutal. Um, look, and then I, uh, when I say it was very slow, I mean, it took us probably 10 years to get to maybe 3 million in revenue. Um, so it wasn't like it was nothing. Like it was a you know decent sort of profitable little small business, but it was only small. And and I I kind of thought if all it's going to be is a small business, I don't think I'm really interested in that. But I don't know what to do next to get it to the next level. Um, you know, do I need to do I need to hire a CEO that knows what they're doing? Do you know? Should I should I just sell it? Should I just sell it and move on? And um, I actually went and saw a business coach. She was great. She was the most money I think I'd ever spent on anything at the time. It was like five hundred dollars an hour. But you know, she asked really smart questions. And in the end, she said, "Right, I want you to do something for me. I want you to go away and write down, like with a pen on a piece of paper." a letter to yourself from 10 years in the future and I want you to talk about your business and everything that it is and you know be quite specific you know how much how much revenue does it make how many staff do you have you know what what's your role in the business and and go away and do that and um, that little exercise was kind of like turning all the lights back on for me and all of a sudden I I knew what I had to do and I knew that I was the only one that could do it and so I thought, right, and I set myself out. She said, right, once you've got that 10 years, break it down as to what you'd need to do to get there in five, you know, to where you'd need to be in five years, what you'd have to do to get there. And then you break that down into smaller and smaller until you've got sort of like quarterly, a strategic plan. And so that was the process I went through. And um, we made a few changes, um, decided to completely replatform the website because we were a bit stuck with where it was at and um, it wasn't sort of the, the, you know, the interactive and informative experience that I wanted it to be. So I started going about that, um, started to take some risks with my margins in terms of um, switching to free shipping, offering a price match guarantee. Um, went really hard again on going to try and, you know, get the brands that my customers wanted. And I thought, right, I'm going to triple the size of the business in three years and did it. Um, and then thought, right, uh, you know, at the end of that process, I thought, right, now I'm going to do it again. And we've just done that too. So, <laughs> so, so now we're about to embark on, because, you know, if I triple it from here, it's like, ooh, that's, that's going to be really big. Okay, <laughs> cool. Um, but yeah, that, that process of actually developing what the vision was and then breaking that down into smaller little chunks um, with sort of, you know, four key areas that I was going to develop and one thing to do for each of those four things every quarter. Um, it was, yeah, hugely valuable. It was like having a map again. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, like, it, it's always, uh, you know, obviously you kind of start off with the vision of what it is that you want to do and I think yeah. it's really easy to be suckered into the day-to-day -day just putting out fires sure. and just a million different things and you kind of, yeah. you know, days, weeks, months, years go by without you kind of like reassessing. Where reassessing, it is. yeah. You've got to keep constantly, you know, once you hit those goals, well, you've got to stop and go, right, well, now where? Now where are we going and how, how would we get there? Yeah. yeah. Is, is there anything that you do now to, to keep that process going for you or like that you take an opportunity to kind of step back and assess whether you're on the right path or, or to kind of look at the next three years or, or is that kind of, you know, just taking it in, in three-year blocks? Um, yes, no, we, we'd still continue to do that um, so that's something that I now do with my team so that's that's really great and so we have that you know that vision of kind of where we want to get to and then we say right what in the next three months can we achieve and we divvy it up and we have weekly meetings in terms of okay what's been everybody's progress on these particular things is the only way you get stuff done is it right well if there's something on a spreadsheet with your name on it and you've got to rock up to next week and you haven't done it why haven't you done it and everybody else has done it so this is the only way you know you got you got to kind of keep on it and and if you don't keep on at it, then yes, it does go by the wayside because when you're in a fast-growing business, 
goodness, there's so many fires to put out all the time and you can get completely distracted and absorbed by that, but then you're not going anywhere. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, obviously, we've kind of touched on some of the very early challenges that, that you had to overcome, and, and they were quite significant challenges as well. But, um, you know, as, as again, we were sort of discussing, the, the problems never really go away. They just change and evolve. You just get different problems. Um, so what what are some of the, the challenges that you've sort of had to co- overcome scaling the business that wouldn't have been um, as obvious to you? Sure. Um, look, I think... Uh, most of the problems, well, a lot of the problems that you get, you know, as you go on and you get bigger and your team gets bigger end up being people problems. Um, and uh, this sort of happened when we went from, you know, in the space of a year, a team of 12 to a team of 25 maybe. Um, and then all of a sudden it's sort of like it wasn't just a little family anymore. And we had a couple of people that were not the right fit and if anybody's ever been in a workplace where that happens, oh God, it makes a mess of everything. You know, even the people who are a good fit, you know, it's just, it's awful and there's size and it's it's just like, personally to me, it was devastating because I'd always felt that, you know, the people in my business were, were family and um, to have, you know, to have people not getting along in such a, a destructive and awful way was just personally to me really devastating. Um, so, uh, and I guess the outcome of that was that we worked out right. We can't, we can't have this happen again. You know, this nearly broke everything. Um, and so to go through with the team, with the remaining team after sort of the fallout from that, and and um, and say right, let's work out what our values are, and let's enunciate them, and let's make sure that everybody knows, and let's make sure that when we hire people, we hire people that are going to be able to work within you know to work that that same way and then I think you know if we can do this and we can do this this right then we'll all be on the same page um and we won't we won't have stuff like this happen again and look that's that's actually been really good it's been a really good thing because from since then from you know from 25 people we've been able to grow to 75 without without problems like that happening again without you know sort of the really destructive things um but yeah to have those those values that align everybody in the team that says, right, this is the way we do things and you can all use these as decision-making tools because there's plenty of times where you could just as easily go one way or the other but the value should tell you which way um, and then we're all going the same way and we're not fighting each other and this is it's much better. How do you test for those values when you're hiring for people? Oh, we are all kinds of questions. <laughs> um, look, it's it's things like um, you know, there's there's some good questions that you can ask. We do we do do a lot of trials as well. So you know, I mean, for instance, the way we hire in the warehouse now is that you you know you have to do a trial for a couple of days before you even get an interview, because you know if you can't sort of work in a real environment with the you know with the people who are there, then it's you know it's not going to work out, um, regardless of how good your interview skills are. So, that, oh, look, there's all kinds of questions. One of the ones that um, usually nobody sees coming is, um, what house are you in at Hogwarts? And uh, and that works really good, apart from when you get people that are sort of, you know, either too old for Harry Potter or too young for Harry Potter. And you're hiring people that are born in, like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, 1999, which is when I started the business, and that makes me feel ancient. Um yeah, so things like that, you know, you, you can often get some interesting answers for people and that gives you good insight. Um, uh, what else do we ask? Things like, um, you know, do you prefer to um, do the right thing or get the right outcome? You know, because either of those is fine. It's just one way is the way we do things and the other way is not the way we do things. Um, so you, you've got to try and pick questions where it's, it's both, both of the answers seem right. Just, you know, pick one. Sure. So you, you actually do the trial period before you offer someone an interview? Uh, for some positions, yes. Yep. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah because I, I imagine, like, you know, I, I, I assume people would kind of, in an interview, you sort of know what the other person wants to hear. That's it. Right? That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, interviews yeah. are a lousy way of hiring people, to be honest. Um, it's just that nobody's really worked out anything much better, particularly for the sorts of positions where it's going to take six to 12 months. To, you know, it's no good getting someone in for two days because you're not going to see enough 
yep. uh, from some positions, you know, the positions where you can see enough in a couple of days, and yes, absolutely do that first. And so we, which house would you have been in, in Hogwarts? Me? Um, look, this is actually a naff answer, and, and I don't like it when people give this in interviews, but I would have been in Gryffindor. Um, but we, we hire everybody. I mean, we got some Slytherins in marketing, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes, you know, for some particular roles, it's you, you've got to be the person that um, is ambitious and, and, you know, wants to, wants to achieve results. There's no, there's no wrong answer. It's just interesting to see why people say things. Yep. Yeah. No, absolutely. Like, I, I think that's absolutely right. Like, it's not so much the answer. It's, it's why they why they said that. Exactly. And, like, the conclusion and what's the th- thought process that went into, that's it. into that response. That's it. Really interesting. Um, so, again, one, like, doing my research on um, on Adore Beauty, uh, one of the things that I kind of found from um, some of the interviews was, like, the importance that you put on customer experience, mm. especially, you know, in the early days. Of, obviously, that's continued on. Sure. But how, how important was customer experience for you in terms of developing that traction and, and kind of helping engage your, your customers? Well, look, when you don't have any f- money for marketing, mm. you know, goodness, you certainly can't afford to lose anybody. You know, <laughs> you've got to do your absolute best if you've managed by some, you know, trick of sorcery to actually acquire a customer, then goodness, make sure they come back and, and uh, you know, ideally try to get them to tell a friend or two. Um, and this was in sort of pre-social media days. And of course, now it's even more, you know, accentuated. You know, all it takes is a couple of, you know, a couple of the right people with the wrong experiences and, um, you know, your reputation's not looking so great and I am actually fully in favor of that I I love customers being in charge of things like that's kind of what our whole business model is built upon is customers being empowered and them being in charge of you know of the experience and of what they want and you know I want them to be demanding it's great it gives us an opportunity to be better because there's a lot of other businesses that can't move as fast as we can or are not used to having to, you know, be at their customers' beck and call. There are plenty of retailers in Australia that are not actually consumer-centric um, and that's our opportunity. Again, like when I, when I meet with a lot of startup founders and they're looking at growth, everyone always looks at customer acquisition. Yeah. Not a lot of founders think about retention or lifetime value of, yeah. of their customers. Yeah. Um, at what stage do you think founders should be thinking about retention oh we think about that first we yes absolutely because if you're just going to lose a customer as soon as you get them then goodness you may as well just put your money in a pile and burn it um yes you know think about that first get all of your retention you know automations and funnels and your customer experience and nail all of that down first before you try and do any sort of scaling of acquisitions otherwise it's it's just a waste Absolutely. In terms of customer experience or, or even just retention, what are some of the, the strategies that have worked for you? Oh, gosh. Um, look, I mean, there's all, you know, there's kind of all of the usual stuff, you know, sort of automated email lifecycle things where if, you know, someone hasn't ordered from you within the sort of the particular amount of time that they usually would, then, you know, just send them an email saying, hey, you know, we've got some new products that we think you like or, hey, do you want to come back and review something that you tried before or you know just anything to to kind of keep them in touch um content's working really well for us at the moment as a way to kind of keep customers engaged in a way that's not always about what the weekly specials are um so that's that's really good and and look at anything that we can do as well to explain who adore beauty is um and we you know we use me a lot for that um you know so every customer from the very first order gets a little welcome pack in their order which is a letter from me explaining how i started the business why i started it what we're all about um and you know basically sort of introducing them and welcoming them and i think that's i mean it's kind of like a no-brainer thing to do with with a brand new customer i mean gosh tell them why you care about them um that's a pretty nice thing to do i, I think i you know i haven't had many businesses do that for me and um and that that works really well. We get a lot of really positive response from that. Um, trying to think of some other things. Oh, look, you know, a bit of sort of surprise and delight in our boxes. I think is always nice. We include a little Tim Tam 
in every order that goes out, like the little individually wrapped ones, and they get Instagram probably more than anything else. We just get so <laughs> pumped about, you know, getting a chocolate biscuit in their order. I think because it has no calories if you get sent it for free. So it's like, it's <laughs> a, you know, it's a, it's a freebie. Um, but that's, yeah, people get really excited then about receiving their orders because they know that, you know, among all the nice, you know, $300 worth of products they're ordered, they're also going to get a chocolate biscuit and that, that kind of makes their day. If you were to to start um, start a new e-commerce brand yep. in 2017, mm-hmm. um what would you do differently and how would you get that initial traction? Assuming that you didn't have a dual beauty or, or you used a base in the background. Ah, uh, well, mm. um, oh, gosh. Look, uh, the things that I would do differently is probably focus on content from the get-go and build a brand that way, um, which probably wasn't something that was really possible when I started anyway. I mean, that's the thing. People ask me what marketing I did at the start, and it's the stuff I did at the start. It's not even around anymore. Um, so, yes, I, I think I think content is a, is a really good place to start, and I see a lot of new businesses doing that really well. Um, I think, yes, positioning yourself as a source of authority for that, you know, whatever your particular category is. Um maybe pick something that's not as difficult as beauty. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, I, no, well, no, I, I wouldn't necessarily do that. I mean, that does, that does provide good barriers to entry as well when it's, when it's difficult to get the product selection. Um, oh, what else? That's a tricky one. Yeah, I, I think um, what you kind of touched on in terms of being an authority and, and kind of putting you front and centre, especially the first time someone orders, I think one sure. of the things that founders often overlook is, you know, um, someone's always going to have more funding than you, someone's going to have a larger brand than you, someone's going to have more presence. What people can't really replicate is the founder and the story behind behind the business. Um, And I think, again, like I I don't think enough sort of founders story tell effectively enough about why they're doing what they're doing or, you know, what what compelled them to come well, start that business. Well, that's right. Go and, you know, watch all of Simon Sinek's talks. You know, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And, and, and as well as that, they buy who you are. Um, and one of the things I've discovered kind of even just in the last 12 months is how powerful authenticity really is. And for me, that's come about um, <laughs> basically since at around the same time Trump got elected, I also went to um, a, a CEO awards ceremony, which was the most misogynistic thing I'd ever been to in my entire life. And, you know, and it was just somehow, it was too much for me. It was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back. And I just went, you know what, I can't be quiet about any of this stuff anymore. And as a woman in, as a woman in technology and, and e-commerce, which it's been a fairly male oriented <laughs> industry for, you know, for many, many years. Um, I, I mean, I just basically got furious and I thought, well, we're buying our shares back from Woolworths, who's, you know, I can't get in trouble for this. I sort of had to think about, okay, what are the negative consequences? Look, I'll probably cop some stuff on Twitter from men's rights activists, you know, fine, I can deal with that. And, um, and just, you know, started speaking out about it, not for any business benefit but just because it was something that really mattered to me and the you know the really tremendous growth in our business has happened since then and maybe it's a coincidence I don't know but I do think there is something very very powerful about being up front about what you care about and particularly when you are prepared to put yourself on the line to stand up for other people um, that's it's, I've come to realise that's, that's a big thing. I didn't know when I was doing it, um, but for me, the things that have opened up since I started doing it has really, has really surprised me. Yeah. Absolutely. Like, I think, um, as you mentioned, I think a lot of people think about taking a stand means that you're going to be offending a lot of people, but what right. they don't realise is that if you're, um, you know, if what you stand for resonates with your audience, they're only going to believe in you and engage with you so much more. Well, that's it. And I think, at, you know, at least... Yeah, don't do it as a branding tool, you know, do it because it matters. Um, And for me, it was more about kind of using it the other way. Okay, right, well, I have a little bit of a profile now. I'm going to use that and I'm going to use it to say that the important and big things that need to be said um, and, you know, and it, it does resonate with my customers as well, which I kind of, I hadn't really thought about that. Um, I just did it. Um, 
speaking of just doing it <laughs> <laughs> and and fi- just just kind of end on this um and you you just touched on it briefly as well uh i think about two years ago you decided to sell a, a stake in the company to woolworths mm-hmm. and you've recently bought that back yeah um, I just wanted to sort of ask you what kind of led to the decision to, to sell in the first place and then what instigated you wanting to, to take back the control? Sure. So as part of the, you know, the big sort of 10-year strategic planning process that I did, I realised that some of the things that I was going to need to do would cost money and I didn't have any. We'd been bootstrapped always. So the business had always been profitable, always been cash flow positive just because, you know, you don't have any other choice. Um but I realised that okay, there was going to be there was going to be a hump of things that I would need to get over because there was money that I would need to spend that I might not get the return on for six or twelve months. So I was going to have to raise, and started thinking about what that might look like, and talked to a whole bunch of people. You know, talked to VCs and talked to you know angel investors and talked to some trade investors as well. And um, Woolies was actually the one that made most sense at the time. Um, because look, they were the biggest online retailer in Australia. You know, they—I mean, no, they weren't experts in premium beauty, but we were. Um, uh, but they had a lot of resources that we thought we could leverage off. And, and I, you know, I guess the thinking was, well, this is this is smart money. This is yes, they were going to put in some equity, but um, you know that there would there would be other benefits as well. Um, and look, in terms of that being successful for us, I mean, it absolutely was. You know, tripled the size of the business in the two years that we had Woolworths as a shareholder. But um, in terms of that being a good place for us to be long term, um, the strategic alignment that was there at the start wasn't there after a while. Um, yeah, it just it didn't kind of make sense, and so we sort of you know had an honest chat about it and said, look, you know. Do you see this going anywhere? We don't really see this going anywhere. And so that's, that was kind of how it ended up. So we bought back. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I, I went to the screening of The New Hustle uh, last night. Oh, yeah, night. I'm dying to see that. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. Um, and I've had Justin Dry from Minimofo on. Yeah, and Justin they, they went through something yeah. similar as well yeah, with the catch yeah, group. Yeah, yeah, well, exactly, yeah. Um, yeah, and it was actually really interesting. Mm-hmm. Justin mentioned how, how much, uh, when they took back control, how quickly the company grew from that point because it was like, you know, they had it was back, it was, you know, 100% them and it was very kind of authentic going mm. back to, to that and that sort of resulted in, in uh, a really big kind of spike in, in growth for them. Yeah, look, I, I don't think... I mean, Woolies was only a minority shareholder f- for us, so with them it was different because cash yeah. was like 80% or something. So so for them it was different and they didn't have control anymore. We, we had control the entire time and, and Woolies had bigger fish to fry anyway, so um, they weren't worried about what we were doing on a day-to-day ba- day-to-day business uh, um, so no I'd, I'd, it wasn't the same for us in that same way it wasn't that I'd suddenly felt oh we have this new you know freedom <laughs> and and independence and it wasn't you know I'd never felt stifled by that relationship particularly anyway so it was it was a bit different for us Sure. Um, on that note, Kate, thanks so much for, for jumping on the show today. My pleasure. Um, off a flight and, and straight on. But uh, yeah, thanks so much for coming on and sharing your experience and insights. For anyone who wants to find out more about you or Adore Beauty, say hello, get in touch. Uh, what's the best way for them to do that? Uh, well, they should come to the website for starters and ideally buy something. <laughs> but um, www.adorebeauty.com.au uh, on Instagram where Adore Beauty of Adore Beauty official, I'm Kate Adore Beauty, or if you want to hear my feminist rantings, you can go onto Twitter, which is Morris underscore Kate. Perfect. I'll make sure all of those links are in the show notes. Kate, once again, thanks for coming on the show. My pleasure. Thanks for listening to episode 64 of the Startup Playbook podcast. You can find the show notes of my interview with Kate, along with a curated list of tools and resources for startup founders at startupplaybook.co. As always, you can join the conversation through our Twitter account. The handle is at Playbook Startup. Don't forget to subscribe to stay up to date with our latest episodes. Thank you for listening and I'll see you at episode 65 next week.